Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to another episode of the Community Live Stream. This is Monday, June 25th, I think. <laughs> Let me do a quick check. Yes, it is the 25th. There are now officially six months until Christmas. Better start your shopping, kids. <laughs> My name is Chuck Tomasi. I am the ServiceNow guy with the cool bow tie coming to you every weekday as much as I can at 1 p.m. UTC, bringing you information from the ServiceNow community that you see behind me. This is a forum of ServiceNow developers and admins and subject matter experts in various parts of the platform and applications. And I dive in and see what I can help with to not only answer questions for you, but give you the thought process behind those questions. Explain how I got to where I got and what the reasoning is and best practices and shortcuts and crazy stuff that we may go off on wild tangents and hopefully you'll learn something. If you do, well, good. Then my time here has been uh, well spent as is yours and I don't want to waste your time because I know how busy you are every day. This is, let me get to the start of the matter. This is done on YouTube, as I mentioned, every weekday that I can, 1 p.m. UTC. It is currently 6 a.m. in sunny Phoenix, Arizona, where the temperature is going to be hotter than the inside of an oven. Maybe I'll go make cookies on the driveway today. Thank you for joining me. If you're just joining live, welcome, welcome. If you're not, hey, I, sub I recommend either way you subscribe to that URL that you see right there. And that way you get notified, like I just did. Make sure that's happening. Yes, there it is on the good old phone. The notification comes up whenever something new is posted there. And it's not just this community information that you watch and learn from here. It is lots of other things around CSM and HR and webinars and who knows what. There's a ton of stuff that goes up on the community channel on YouTube. So I encourage you to subscribe. If you learn something, if you find something helpful in here, click the like button. It will help others recognize what is helpful and what is friendly here. We also simulcast this on Twitch. Same thing. If you're familiar with Twitch, you know what it's about. Largely used by gamers, but more coders and uh, all kinds of other programming coming in there. So no extra effort to me to do two, two, two broadcast bands, just a checkbox in the uh, broadcasting software to say go to YouTube and go to Twitch. Twitch only keeps the backlog around a couple of weeks, whereas YouTube, I have them back to the beginning. So if you really are interested and in see what the humble beginnings were back in November to this show, it's evolved a little bit, a little more production on it, a little more work. I got to get up a little earlier every day to give you the information in a, in a clean, coherent format rather than just uh, grab a cup of tea and here we go. I want to make sure that you've got the information you need. I also encourage you, if you are watching live, give me a shout out. Love to say hi. Hello, Fipsy. Good morning to you from Amsterdam. We've got our first chat, shout out in the chat. Put that in there. Love to help you out. If you've got a question around ServiceNow regarding, well, anything, if you've got a question, an issue, recommend that you go over to community.servicenow.com, put it in there. Antonio, good morning to you as well. Although in Amsterdam, is it, isn't it technically the afternoon? So that's why I start out good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I realize I am talking to you anywhere and any time and any place. But uh, again, if you've got a question about ServiceNow, go over to the community. Got to get my brain back on track. I like to do that a lot. If you've watched, you know that happens. And well, some people say that's part of the charm of this, <laughs> this series is that uh, anything could come into my head and, and do that to me. Uh, if you've got a question, go over to the community. Make sure that you put it in the right sub forum so that you get the maximum chance of a subject matter expert reading it and responding to it. That way, if you've got a question on performance analytics and reporting, I recommend you put it in the performance analytics and reporting. If you put it in the developer section, you may or may not get somebody who knows how to answer that question about breakdowns within breakdowns or formula indicators or whatever it happens to be. But the, the really smart people are going to be hiding out in those niche places. Developer community, great place to ask scripting questions, general architecture questions, that kind of stuff is, is uh, very well placed in there. So check and make sure that your, your sub community is on target. 1504 there, nine hours ahead in Amsterdam. 
That's right, because you're on Central Eastern Time. Uh, the UK is one hour behind you. We were in Europe a month ago, so got to remember who's on what time. It's funny because we went from London to Paris, and they're about the same longitude, but for whatever reason, the UK likes to do their own thing when it comes to time, money, and I'm not going to get into that. This is not a political discussion. This is all about service now. Uh, mention the community. Let's also mention the developer site. Go to developer.servicenow.com. Get yourself a free personal developer instance. Learn all about the scripting APIs. Get some learning plans. Free. All of this is free at developer.servicenow.com. There's also good information about meetups, which I'll get to in just a second. Lots and lots of good information over at developer.servicenow.com. You also become part of the developer program. Get the course quarterly newsletter, find out all kinds of good information, what happened, where the cool stuff is happening in your area, what's coming. You'll see it there, developer.servicenow.com. And that means that I also need to tell you about, oops, wrong way. I didn't need to get bigger. I needed to hide the titles. Wrong key. Slight slip of the keyboard. Apologize for that. Meetups that are coming up, developer meetups that are happening. Uh, these, this is not a comprehensive list. I do this on Sunday night so that it's ready for the whole week. And this will soon be obsolete in a few days. But if you are in Sacramento, California, I invite you to stop by and uh, check that out. A very good group over there. I've been, I've been to one or two of their meetings. Good stuff. Uh, Las Vegas and Cincinnati are both having one on the 28th. That is also coming up. And then Paris next week. If you happen to be in Europe yourself, might want to stop in on Paris. Long time overdue. I don't think they've had a meetup since December. So looking forward to this one. I will not be able to make it to that, that one in particular, but I am looking to attend more of them in Q3 and Q4. You never know where or when I'll be showing up to those things, but I will make my presence known on meetup.com. If you go to the URL on the bottom, you can see a complete list of all of the developer programs up to date because as soon as people schedule them, that's where they show up and then they get to the developer site. So there's a there's a little bit of a latency. So some of the ones coming up in your area, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we have another one in Phoenix towards the end of July. Having a good time with that. And oh, by the way, I did resolve my uh, issues from the Phoenix developer meetup. We were doing an import and we had a couple of questions and, and issues. I do have a little bit of follow-up work to do, but we did get those spreadsheets imported, and I hope to follow up at the next Phoenix meetup with the solutions and the way that everything came out. Short answer is, I do another series uh, for ServiceNow, if you're not familiar, called Tech Now. It is a monthly web series that I do with Craig Stepp and some other hosts that uh, we present platform and developer content. And uh, we have an app. Surprise, surprise. We have a ServiceNow app on the ServiceNow platform for a ServiceNow web series. And we started using a new service back in April. And I'm importing this rich information that they give us, but they give it to us in spreadsheets. So I wanted to bring it into ServiceNow and make it more a bit easier to mine, easier to manage, easier to refine, easier to report on, that sort of stuff. Good morning, ServiceNow fan. Good to see you again. Good morning, Abdul. Love hearing from all these people. These are my breakfast people. And... I don't know. Is it even breakfast time? Probably not where you are. Maybe where I am. Whew. Almost done. A we'll couple more screens and we'll get going with the good stuff. Want to make sure everybody gets in their seats, has their coffee or tea by them or logged in, whatever it happens to be. We've also got a number of events that are coming up. These are just a few of them that you see. If you go to the URL on the bottom at the events page on servicenow.com, you can find more. Just wanted to pique your interest. So there's a lot of stuff out there. There's GRC, there's CSM, there's HR, there's... Why am I just spouting out letters? Why is this whole industry all about letters? ITSM. <laughs> ITIL. Well, that almost made a word. That's an acronym. Oh, no tea this morning. It's summer in Phoenix. It's already 104. I don't need tea to keep me warm. All right. If you want to find out more, I do broadcast these things out practically on a daily basis over at LinkedIn. So follow me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. The usual social media stuff. Chuck Tomasi. There's not too many of me out there. Good morning, Kevin. Glad you had your breakfast. We're ready to go. Breakfast, the most important meal of the day. And finally, wanted to remind you one more time that TechNow episode 54 is coming up. We're going to be talking about the scripting debugger that's built into ServiceNow, show you how it's used, get started, some of the benefits of using it, and how it can speed up your development environment. 
got an example program with some real broken code in it. It's it's really hard to write broken code. <laughs> Once, when you, first, you've got to write the code, debug it, get it working, and then break it again for a demonstration. So it's, it's kind of crazy. But uh, I will be doing that on the 10th. We also have a community quick tip. We like to stick in a short little snippet that I'm inspired by this group. So as I go through the community, uh, I pick something out and say, you know what, I could explain that or demonstrate that in just a few minutes. So we stick one of those and we've been doing that for about a year, year and a half, and people seem to enjoy this. So register at the link at the bottom, bit.ly slash TN54reg, and we will do that. Hands on the right keyboard so that I can get us back to work. And there we are. There's the community. Good morning. Good morning, Carolyn. You don't drink tea to stay warm, you drink it to enjoy it, though I didn't drink too much when I lived in the deep South Texas. You're right, I do drink it to enjoy it, and how it's made is very important. I learned that from some British people years and years ago. They came over and mocked my tea-making skills, but when they showed me the right way to do it, mm, boy, it just gets so much better. All right, we're not here to talk about tea, we're here to talk about service now. Let me do a quick refresh on this page. This is the community that you see behind me again, community.servicenow.com, if you want to join in the fun. I did have somebody on LinkedIn ask me, hey, can I ask you more questions? I said, please ask them over on the community because the, the issue with responding to LinkedIn is it's not a very effective system of record. We'd be sending messages back and forth in my inbox. She would be the only one that was benefiting from my answers or maybe answers if I could have answers. This way you get more subject matter experts on it. I'm only on the community about once a day. I'm on LinkedIn even less. So by putting it in here, you help others, you help yourself, you get others to help. That's what a community is. Rather than a one-to-one -one interaction uh, that I may or may not know the answer, there's a better chance of getting them answered here. So wonderful community. I've been in many, many online communities in the past, and this one is the best that I've been on by far. Everybody's helpful, everybody's friendly, it's well organized. We just brought it onto ServiceNow platform in February, so there are opportunities for improvement. If you do, I mentioned the various sub forums, there is one called, um, gosh, I can't even remember now. It's called Member Feedback. So if you go to Communities over here on the left and you say All Forums, right there, second from the bottom, there is one called Member Feedback. And that is where you can make comments about the community. If you see something you like, if you don't see something you like, search, of course, like all other communities. You want to make sure that you're not just repeating something that's already been asked. There are a number of questions in here. For example, if I want to look at all the unsolved ones that don't have an answer, I can upvote these things. I can say, you know what? There's this discussion about pasting code into a post. I don't know what this is about, but somebody wants to do this, they'd like to do it, they show how, you can upvote it, and our community team says, hey, what is popular, what is trending, what are people asking for? We should look at implementing that first. Excuse me. Dan, who's one of our community people, uh, one of our staff, we actually have staff to run this community and keep the software up to date, is very helpful and very responsive to that as well. So, good team. Good community, what do you say we get going? How to change the state of work order task by REST API. Let's dig into that. It looks like it's already got some responses, if I read that right. Four days ago, hi everyone, I'm currently new to ServiceNow working on work order. I have set up a work order template which contains four dependency tasks and I want to change the state of task by API. I come to know that after assigning task to a user, state change to 17. When user accepts it, then the state changes to 18. And when I when I start working on it, the task changes to 19. And at least when the task is complete, changes back to 3. The states on the task table have numeric values. It's one of the few places you find this, this integer value. Uh, that was originally done years and years ago. It's one of the original fields from like 2004 that, um, that does that. So you'll often find this mismatch between the English label and the value, uh, but it, it once you get into it, it, it actually makes for some logical sense when you're doing programming comparisons. Now, obviously today we wanna to get less scripting involved with the platform, but we do still retain that and it's something you know. So the, the first 
out of the box ones are minus five and then one through seven. So these 17, 18, 19 numbers implicitly tell me from experience that these are states that they've made up. And you can definitely add states to your process. So let's do show all replies and see what's been happening with this conversation. If you're getting a 200 message, did they, did they say what they were getting? Oh, I didn't finish the discussion. So I'm finding a way through which I can change the state after user accepts it, like 18 via REST API. When I'm when sending the data via REST API, I'm getting response 200. 200 isn't okay. It says, okay, I understood what you gave me. Credentials are okay. I've made the change, but the states remain 16. I've also tried to close the task by the API sending it in data body. Here's the body that they have. Work notes, close task. State three, use cl you close code one. But again, I've received a response 200 okay, but no change to the state. I'm still in 16. Um, using a put request, put patch post. You should be using post. I would say use post instead. Um, username and password are authorized. If you're getting a 200, the message as a response status, the rest message is proper. However, you have to verify the mandatory fields to change one state to another. For example, close, it's required. You move it to another state if required to dispatch group. So he's going through the process of work orders. I don't know work order that well, but I am uh, fairly confident with REST APIs. Thanks for your valuable response. Whereas I have already assigned dispatch group to this task, uh, what was I just thinking about this? Oh, hey, you might want to try using a post. Let me, you know what I discovered? Interestingly enough, I, I saw this this morning and I wasn't sure if my eyes were deceiving me or not. But as I typed, started typing it here, you might. And then I said reply up here. It carried my reply up there. I thought that was interesting. Let's see if it goes the other way too. Uh, no, because I can't reply down here. Yes, it does. Interesting. Okay, it carries the content. So if you're replying at the wrong level, it will just move the content over there. Now, I had canceled that, so now there's no reply. Okay, you might want to try a post instead of a put. I don't do puts and patches too often. Um, not unless the API just directly requires it. The other thing they should try is doing this with the REST API Explorer, which is a free onboard thing. We talked about this in April on TechNow episode 49. REST API Explorer is a built-in, kind of like Postman. It, it, it allows you to examine the tables. Because it's integrated, it automatically knows the tables. For example, I go to Incident, and it will pull up the Incident table eventually as soon as it's done caching and learning and doing all this other stuff. But you can set the API, you can take the version, retrieve a record, create a record is done with post, um, update and modify. Now see if I've already got a record, let's go to the incident list. Wow, somebody is really not happy. My browser got confused because I had a pull down and then I went to the filter. If I will go to the incident list and I get a list of open records, just a little bit about REST APIs. And let's say I want to add a caller to this. A uh, caller is going to be difficult because I don't have a society. Mm, I can do this. I can do this. We'll go get a caller. Let's take mm, Bo Ruggieri. I don't know if I can copy the society right out of there. Could you do that? Let's find out. Let's go to my text editor. Text Wrangler is my free editor for doing quick demos. Good morning, Rahul. Good to see you this morning. Thank you for joining. This is the community live stream where I go through. I'm currently doing a discussion on REST APIs. Just a quick introduction about how you can use them. And we're exploring the difference between puts, patches, and post. So I'm going to take the sysid, and I don't know whether or not that is I'm going to use a REST API to update this record, but I want to use a post to update the caller on incident 49. Let's also grab the sysid from there. If it's the same, I know it didn't work. No, it didn't. Okay, so this is the incident. And this is the user. And let's just assign 
for simplicity, we'll take 49 and assign it to bow. So at the end, I should see number 49 assigned to bow. I can make a quick REST API call. Let's go back to the REST API Explorer. On my favorites, REST API Explorer comes up. Give it a second to load those tables again. There's only a couple thousand tables in the system. Shouldn't take that long. Can I, if I do a create, no, see, there's no society. Okay, so I do have to do rats. I gave them bad information. Let's change that. You know what? I'm going to delete that because it's completely bogus. Post will create a record. I don't do that often, but I'm retracting that statement. The reason I see this is because when I click post, it's for create a record, and I don't have a way of specifying a sys ID. So without that, there's no way to update that record. If I want to modify a record or update a record, I could use a put or a patch, and there are subtle differences uh, between put and patch. I'm not going to get into them today because I can't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, one is if the record exists. I, uh, I'm trying to remember. Somebody explained it to me, and I even echoed it into the community, and now I don't remember. But create a record would be what table do you want, what values do you want, and it will go ahead and create that record. You know what? Maybe if I hover over it, it'll tell me. Nope. All right, then I'm going to learn again. Maybe this time it will stick. Uh, REST API put versus patch. There it is. And when you use patch, you only update the field you specify and leave the rest alone. For example, the difference between put and patch requests is reflected in the way the server processes the enclosed. Oh, okay. The put method requests that enclosed entity be stored under the supplier's requested URI. If the requested URI refers to an already existing resource, the enclosed entity should be considered as modified version of the only one residing on the origin server. The patch method requests that a set of changes described in the request entity be applied to the resource identified in the requested URI. So patch patches it, put, still not sure what a put is. Someone give me an example. Let's go to a different description. Maybe it's clearer there. HTTP put versus HTTP patch. Tell me in English. Pictures are nice too. When to use put and when patch. Let's start with a simple, simple statement. Oh, they're doing it in code. Somebody else's code too. When a client needs to replace an existing resource entirely, they can use a put. When they're doing a partial update, they can use patch. Ah, then that case, this might be a better use case for patch. All right? Think of the value of response. Have you? Now, ultimately, it's how it's implemented in the ServiceNow platform. Have you considered using patch instead of put? That's what I was looking for, not post. Scrambled brain this morning. Let's see what else we can find. That was an interesting discussion. Want to play around in the unreplied section? Let's look for what's new. OLEDB driver in service now. Sounds like I should be talking to my television. <laughs> Isn't that OLED? Oh, is OLEDB the next generation? Um, service now SQL Server integration. Let's find out what this is about. Not sure we understand. Hi there. I'm trying to get the get data from a SQL Server which is linked to 200 plus server, they have linked server. I was trying to use ODBC activity, but it seems to need an OLEDB driver in service now. Hmm. Don't have any details on that, but it helps if we understand, are you getting any error messages? If so, can you share them? Take a look in the logs. 
system logs or on the screen when you run the transform in the foreground. Hopefully get some information. Why does excluding table data during cloning is not the best practice? Hmm. So cloning is the process of taking one instance and making a replica on another, taking your prod data, for example, and cloning it down to dev so that you have up-to-date prod information that you can develop with. If you had no data, you'd have developers plugging in, and sometimes that's not always the best use cases for testing. Hi, experts. We are planning to upgrade a test instance. When cloning prod to test, we want to exclude prod data and preserve mock data in the test instance. As per now, we understood that ServiceNow considered scripts slash business rules also as table data. I don't believe that's true. Oh, well, all records are stored in the table. Business rules, script includes, UI actions, UI policies, they're all stored in a record in some table. So that we cannot exclude, and even tables, it is the same. And also it seems like ServiceNow suggests that it is best practice to clone everything to subprod. No, not necessarily. Attachments may not need those. Example, we cannot exclude user data as it is referenced by hundreds of tables. And again, those tables are referenced by hundreds of tables. Do we need to find all the tables that are being affected and write the rules for it before cloning? Is there any subset of tables that we can exclude? Is there any solution for it? I think it's normal requirement that companies do have. Any inputs will be helpful. Okay, do you want to exclude, what do they want to, can you be more prescriptive? Can you be more specific about the data you want, the tables you want to exclude? You want to exclude. If you are excluding tasks, users, CMDB, etc then what's the point of cloning? The normal, the, the, the reason most organizations clone is to refresh that data from prod to subprod instances. Changes like business rules, form layouts, etc., are done in dev and flow up while transactional data like incidents, problems, CIs, etc., are captured in prod and cloned down. Need to understand what the underlying requirement is. Just like a lot of things that go on in the community, if you don't explain what it is you're after and why, it makes it hard to give a solution. So and sometimes the answer is there and I just don't understand it. That's where you guys come in handy. They go, no, 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 Chuck, give me something. Feel free to jump into the conversation at any point and I will do my best to interpret, relay, understand, and we all learn something that way. That's why this is the greatest community in the world. Pulling CI info to a portal form. UI policies are not working on service portal after upgrading to Kingston. This, where it depends where they came from. UI policies are not working on service portal after upgrading to Kingston. We kept we kept to run the UI policy on both portal and desktop, still not working. Has anyone faced the issue? Please let me know, fix it. Can you be more specific? Is this UI policy involved script? Can you share the UI policy? Are you seeing any errors in the console log? Do, 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 does your UI policy involve any scripting? So lots of questions. Again, you gotta be, it's, it's like going to the doctor and saying, 
my arm hurts, fix it. It could be anything from tennis elbow to cancer. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a little hard unless you have more information to diagnose and treat it. So I guess I could be, maybe I should call myself Dr. Chuck. That wouldn't work. I have no medical credentials, nor do I have a PhD. So never mind. I respect those who do, including my oldest daughter, who just got her PhD this spring. Insert records into CMDB for a mid-server script include. SAML redirection, PA script, how to avoid jQuery and JS prototype use in client script. Data imports. I'm skipping over a lot of this stuff because my specialty is in uh, custom applications, integrations, platform in general. So I'm trying to find areas where I can help. <laughs> Dr. Pepper. Task collection dictionary move to scoped application. Let's find out what this one's about. Sounds intriguing. Task collection dictionary move to scoped application. When I see the task table from dictionary module, I see the application scope as security incident. Ooh, that's interesting. When I see the task table from tables module, I see it in global. Oh, huh. I don't know how this happened in my instance, but I don't think there's a way to change the application. So if you're looking at it, it, it's not, oh, it is editable there. Interesting. This record isn't global, but app, security incident is the current application. To edit this record, click here. So it knows there, but it doesn't give an argument about there. Is that, it's the same table task in square brackets. That's interesting. That sounds like a bug. Posted 19 days ago. I don't know how this happened in the instance, and I don't think there's a way to change the application scope. There isn't. Uh, due to some, some of the global ACLs like catalog, I don't have security... What's the scope? <laughs> security incident. I don't think I have that activated on my instance. Let's go to plugins. Under system definition plugins. Take a look. Plugins are a way to extend the functionality of the platform. Your standard out of the box or personal developer instance comes with many of them already activated. You can see that uh, the activity formatter, for example, that, that history that you see on the bottom of an instance, in, in, uh, incident is already turned on by default, but there are many others. If you wanted to activate Agile Development 2.0, you could do that. Let's look for security. Probably going to come up with a few. Security dashboard, security incident analytics, security incident response, security operations. You know what? I have no idea what plugin I'm looking for, so let's go to the docs. First time today, I'm going to go to docs.service.now, docs.servicenow.com. Brain is jumping all over the place. I have parody errors left and right. Good morning, cooking fever. <laughs> Good morning, Snehal from India. India has checked in. Amsterdam has checked in. <laughs> Florida has checked in. I have a mental pin going in the map right now. That would be a fun app to do as you check in. Pin the map. What was I looking for? Security incident. Docs.servicenow.com. Security incident tree map. Security incident response. Security. Incident. You know what? I'm going to pick one of these because I love the fact on the right-hand side, it just throws you into this tree. Excuse me, left-hand side throws you into this tree and you can kind of figure out what you're looking at. So under security incident response, it's part of security operations. Does it set up activating security incident response? See this new new doc site is pretty cool when you get when you're aware of where you're going. And then of course it drills me down even further so I can see what documents are around it. This is part of that, this is under that and so on and so forth. There's a hierarchy to these documents that I can follow along with and I tend to leverage that a lot. If I don't know exactly where I'm going, I jump in the middle and then use this contents over on the left to navigate around. Plug in. I want service management core, which I think is turned on anyway, but let's find out. Service 
management core. This is Chuck doing stuff that Chuck doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm out of my comfort zone, but that's where we learn, right? Let's get rid of that. I have two filters on there. Service management core is not turned on. All right, let's see what else it says. Task outage relationship, tree map, threat core. My goodness. Security incident response support, security support orchestration. This would probably take me the rest of the show to turn these plugins on. Although, I do have another computer off to my left. This time I do mean my left, that I could start activating plugins there. And then we can keep working while those are going. That sounds like a deal. Let's do that. So go to that same instance. We'll keep that docs page up. And I'm hoping there's one in here that has dependency. So if I turn on, say, security support orchestration, what will it say? Plugins, plugins, security support orchestration. If I turn on security management core and say activate, it will usually tell me dependency status. Boom, 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 boom. Service management geolocation will be activated. Some of these others are already installed. I'll start there and then I'll come back to the rest. So I was looking for service management core. Name contains service management core. Activate. Activate. All right, those are turning on. And all I did is I right clicked on here, said activate. Oops. Can't do that anymore. You got to click in and then hit activate. It's in the process of activating. That's why I'm not getting the UI actions. <laughs> okay, so let's hang on to that tab. That's why I like opening things in another tab. We might come back to that in a little bit. Well, let's refresh this list of the unreplied things. Make sure there's nothing popping up in the inbox that we need to respond to before the show is over. Keep the conversations going. Four things in the inbox. Yeah, let's get to that real quick. I'll jump in and clean out the inbox. Then I've got a topic that I want to cover with you before I go. Something I thought you might find interesting. Thought about this over the weekend. How to change the state of the work. This is back to our REST API question about changing that state, show replies, show replies. And I said, have you considered using a patch instead of put? Uh, hi, I've also tried it via patch as well, but it didn't work. Also, what about dispatch group, which he mentioned? I also have to send dispatch group, which consists of a link and value property. Do you think any business rule creating the issue? I'm trying to update the status from accepted to start. So I'm kind of backwards in your. Also, when I send work notes, into web requests, then notes are updated, but only those creating the issue in the state. Um, I don't know enough enough about the work order process to say why it's not updating, but it could be a business rule. It could be a state model. Have you checked the logs? That's always the first place I go. And I want to give him links for state models. Mm, let's go back to the doc side. I know I have that other tab open, but I don't want to lose it because I've got my links to the, the, uh, the names of the plugins. All right, that plugin has been refreshed. Now we're multitasking. State management. And that includes state models go back to his post on the inbox highlight command k paste open in a new window okay done i haven't been ringing the bell there's a certain satisfaction in doing that okay Next plugin that I need to activate to get this going. Go to the doc site. Task outage relationship. Hmm, 
Task outed really. Oh, it has a dash in it. Activate that. Get that going. Shouldn't take too long, but who knows. Uh, here's the old LEDB driver. I asked if there were anything in the logs. Kind of a theme with me. Any error messages? And they said, thanks for the quick reply. Requirement is I need to fetch databases, logins, and their roles dynamically. I was trying to use PowerShell, but it seems they have multiple servers where this SQL is installed. So from one server, they said it's not possible to get data. They asked me to install OLEDB driver and service. Now I have no idea how or what I need to do. Well, no, ServiceNow doesn't generally... Well, you cannot install the server, the a driver on the server directly. But in this case, I don't think you need to. What you more likely need is a that driver installed on the mid server this would be in the form of a jar file and I'm gonna look in the community and see if there's any information that I can cross link to search 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 Installing jar on mid server. This allows you to extend the capabilities of the mid server. And I'm going to install the difference between Istanbul and Jakarta. Install mid server. Unable to install mid server as to Istanbul. Istanbul. Maybe it's in the docs. Let's look in the docs. Mid server jar. Those are Java libraries that you can put on there. Synchronize jar file to mid servers. You can upload a jar file to an instance and synchronize it to all mid servers. That sounds about right. How you use those things, I really don't know. The instance doesn't have direct access to your database servers. But the mid server does since it is installed inside your organization's network. There's probably no more about mid servers. Docs, mid servers. And you know what? That was rather lame. I don't like putting just links out in the open. Docs, jar files. Window new. Bring that up. Get the other thing on mid servers. See, again, I drilled in here and I can just click that and get right to mid servers. Pretty easy to navigate around. Back to his message in the inbox. That other, the other, I'm, I'm now I'm triple tasking. I'm responding to an inbox, installing plugins, and I still have to get to that topic I wanted to cover with you guys about timeline pages. Okay, ask the experts, record producers, and interceptors. We have a question on a previous episode of Tech Now. Question or comment. Question regarding the use of interceptors. You mentioned adding the record producer to the service catalog. I'm looking for a way to, to intercept the service catalog link and have it provide two options, and one of those will point to the record producer while the other points to a different record producer. Is it possible or am I forced to create a separate catalog item for each? The interceptors, I gotta refresh my memory real quick. So let me go to my instance. I think the interceptors only work on tables and forms. Let me look at the interceptor list while I continue to load another plugin. This is fun. Tree map.
Tremap is inactive, so let's activate that. Interceptors list says it intercepts a dot do. There's no arguments after it, so that means you can't intercept com.glide.catalog. whatever it is. Um, no, the interceptor's not going to work in this case. An interceptor is not going to work in this case because the catalog item is a parameter to the, to the processor, whatever's happening underneath there, the dot do part of the URL. You can put in lists and forms, but not specific catalog items. All right, that answers that. Interceptors, if you're not familiar with them, are a defined way of saying, I want to do this thing, whether it's create a record, create a form, whatever it is. And the system goes, wait, someone's defined that you can't do that directly. I'm going to give you some options. For example, if you go to schedule jobs, and say system definition, schedule jobs, and click new. This is, a, it intercepts the new record creation. That's where the name comes from. In an, almost a wizard format, you can have it tiered, but I often don't see things go beyond tiered. This is the manifestation of that interceptor definition. It says, you are trying to create a record on the sys auto table. What do you want to do? Because I have several ta sub tables to this. You don't create a record on this table. I'm going to guide you to the correct table. And I can say, I would want to automatically want to run a script or create a job. And this brings us to the typical, here is a scheduled job with a script in the sysauto sys script table. Sysauto underscore script is the table. And that is how I got to this record. Another look at that would be task. If I said task.list, is that something new? Hold on there. What was that? It had some sort of autocomplete going on. Did you see that? Task. What is that? Doesn't do it with incident. Never saw that before. Hey, we've discovered something new. Let's play. Task.struct. Never heard of that before. Didn't know it was a thing. Where does it bring me? It brings me to the table definition. Interesting. Could I also do incident.struct? Now capital will open it up in a new tab. So lowercase struct dot. Why is my thing just not really playing along very well here? Incident dot incident.list. Did it just break? <laughs> my, my period key doesn't want to work all of a sudden. I can't go to incident.do. Anyway, I was going to show you task.list, another interceptor. We'll come back and play with that more. Fascinating that it brings me here. That's not where it's supposed to bring me to. It's supposed to bring me to a list of all tasks. Let's try it with the capital list. This should prove my point anyway. But if I'm on a list of tasks, you don't create a task at the task level. Everything else is a subclass of task. Incident, problem, catalog task, project task. It says, okay, here are the tasks I know about. Which ones? And some of them look like they're repeated because update sets being installed multiple times get a little crazy sometimes. And... I have all these interceptors. When you extend the task table, it creates an interceptor for you automatically. That's just part of what, I think there's a business rule that does that for you. And then I can say, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to create an incident. And then it will take you to the new incident form. I'm gonna have to find out what happened to my, I wonder if one of those plugins that I activated just kind of dorked this thing up. How many more of these plugins do I have? Threat core. See how many I have. 
view plugin. Nope, didn't want to view plugin. I want to go back to plugins. Activating plugins off to the left. Threat. Threat core is inactive. You're probably gonna have to come back to this one tomorrow to finish up that particular question and or thread. There's a few more plugins that we need to activate to make this happen, to, do, to explore more. Uh, before I go, I want to show you something else, though. This was in my notes. They're called timeline pages. Somebody had asked, and i got to remember where it is. Here's the community link for it. They asked this morning, or last night, or three days ago, is there a Gantt chart, Gantt chart view of the following change in maintenance schedule possible? So when you ask for a change calendar, it comes up in a calendar page. This is a type of report. And it's a very good type of report. Michael Fry, very smart person, very uh, active on the community, says if you're looking for a change schedule module, I don't see it in your screenshot, maybe it's inactive. I said, have you thought about a timeline page? Uh, to which this person says, our customer saw a change view, and they are requesting the same view in a Gantt chart mode. Gantt chart is, is great for when you have dependencies. Something needs to finish before another one starts. That's typically where a Gantt chart is used in project tasks, and they are connected in some way. There's a relationship table, much like the CMDBI relations, relationships have. A timeline page, on the other hand, they've been around for eight, ten years. It's been a while. I remember when um, Bo Ruggieri was showing them to me at LH 10 or 11. And... Let me give you a quick demonstration of what they look like. Hopefully I can get there. Now that my navigator's freaked out. Uh, you often see these in a schedule like this. I loaded up some sample data for my loaner request system. It has a timeline page defined on it. And some are defined where you can edit the elements and say, well, let's extend this backwards. And it will update the record accordingly based on the fields that are defined of what you're using. If I hover over it, it, I can define which fields I want to display in here. And I thought I could click through it, but I can't seem to click through these today for whatever reason. You can change the frame, uh, the reference window there. You can drag out here and say, I want to see it you know, more or less that way or more or less this way. You can change the window at which you're viewing it there. You can jump to any particular start and end date. So that's, that's the way it looks. The definition is actually pretty easy. I'm going to go in reverse order here. So let's take a look at the module definition. When you define modules, most people are... Let me bring up the right scope so I can actually show you the options that are in here. Loaner request is the scope. I know I could have clicked one link, but if something tells me I'm going to need more information in here. Most of this looks pretty similar. Here's the title of your module. Here's the application menu, the order, etc. The visibility, I don't have any roles on it. The link type is, you know, normally we pick list of records or URL from arguments. There is a timeline page. Sometimes we pick separator if we want to make nice little separators like this. Timeline page is an actual out-of-box link type that you can put. And the page definition is the name of the page. So if I go into the timeline page record definition by clicking through this, you can find it. Also, if you want to create a new one, just type timeline up here and it will be under system UI timeline pages. You tell it what table you want to pull your records from, any filtering you want to do on the records, in case you know, mine may be active is true, uh, sort by active, ascend it. I may want to see the completed ones. I may not want to see the completed ones when they become inactive. So you can turn on and off certain records for that. Do you want to show the grid lines? Do you want to span text? Uh, auto refresh is disabled. I interactive options. This is where you say, do you want to allow horizontal end? Do you want to adjust it or not? And if you do, what fields are tied to that? Which is, I can't remember where that's defined. The tooltip, when I hovered over, what fields do you want to show? Don't go overboard with the span text fields. That was the two that were shown here. If I go to recent, 
Where's the timeline page I was just looking at? I've been bouncing around so much. Loner schedule. So the tooltip is what I get when I hover over. The, the two here, Dennis IBM and Lizzie Torregrosa, is the CI and the, the username. Those are defined. Now that one I should be able to jump back to, right? There we go. Those two are defined down here in the span text fields. So I've got a lot of flexibility with this timeline page, and it's a very interesting way to show how these records are organized in a time span framework, rather than a calendar, especially if they span multiple dates. Uh, may not be exactly what they're looking for. The start time field is defined here. The end is here. I wish these two were together. It would make more sense. But that's what you use to say, where am I going to start this element and where am I going to finish on the timeline page? Very helpful. Again, if you find that useful, it might be helpful to implement in your application as an interactive method for people to move things around, kind of like virtual task boards. But in instead of seeing things by column or assigned to whatever, you could see them in a, in a time frame method. The UI could probably use a little refreshing. Timeline pages have not been touched in years and years, but that's okay. They still work. They're still functional, as you can see. When I go to the loaner request page, I can get at a glance a schedule of what's coming up, what's been in the past, where do I want to go, adjust that visualization. My naming scheme could probably use a little bit of uh, improvement here. I look at that it was defined. I don't know if scope jumped into that or not. Yeah, now I don't have a choice on the name. So be nice if I could put a display value here that was better than that. Then it would show up at the top. But uh, scoping and timeline pages are not terribly friendly, user friendly, but it does the job. If I go to loaner schedule, I see the loaner schedule. What the title is at the top isn't that important to me. Somebody's probably going to ask you at some point. So I just wanted to point out timeline pages and how helpful they can be. And if you think they're helpful, again, maybe you can use them in your application. Did I have one more thing in the inbox before I go? I have a couple more things in the inbox before I go. Uh, email script. The above script, this is 38 minutes ago. The above script is not pulling macro variables on summary view. Mm, this is the print view at VARS. It's not pulling macro variables because this script doesn't involve macro variables. You're going to have to define what macro variables are actually involved. That was, here's a bunch of stuff. I'm going to refresh this, see if there's still a couple things in there or if this is actually back to zero. It's probably up to like five. <laughs> you got to wrap this up. We're running out of time. We got the rest of the day ahead of me. It's a happy Monday. How to show table list in service portal. Somebody was asking if there was a way to do the sorting. And if you click on the labels in service portal, even though it doesn't look like a linkable link, it will sort by column. And they said, uh, is there a way to do column filter, a column searching, much like there is in, in the standard list when you pull it down and you've got the little magnifying glass and you can type in star email and it'll say, let's look for things where this contains email. I do not have a way to do that. I don't know if there is a way. Uh, there may be a widget on the service portal to help people do that. They were also looking for uh, preferences. So if I sorted it by caller rather than number, can it come back and remember that I sorted it by caller? Those are going to be uh, custom impl implementations of a list widget that you'll need to find. I don't know if they're out there on share. I recommended, hey, did you check on share to see if there's anything available? And... Piyush Sharma responds back about our REST API changing states that isn't working. This will be our last thing we do before we take off. Or not, if this thing refuses to load. Let's reload the whole page, see what happens. Worst comes to worst. We will tag out here. Okay, how to... I give it just a second so I can jump to the response. I've also tried to check state management state models, whereas there's no state model installed yet. I'm currently using default states. 
Okay, state models are a great way to control what states people have available to them, and it does apply to non-interactive sessions as well. If you define your state model that says, I can only move from open to work in progress, or new to work in progress, I can't move from new to closed, uh, then if you try to use a REST API or a script or something else that says, go to closed, and you're not in a state that allows you to get there, it will error out and say, no, you can't go to closed. You're not allowed. You can only go to closed from resolved, and you're not in resolved yet. So it enforces those very nicely on the server side. It's not just a UI policy kind of thing. It also, if you've got an interactive state column, the drop downs are filtered to where you can only go. I cover this in one of the episodes. I can't remember what the number is in uh, the tech shorts series I do on the developer portal which you can find, if I remember right, see if I got the right key, right there at youtube.com slash servicenow dev program. That is where you can find live coding happy hour, tech shorts, and a number of other educational series if you're more interested in that. State models are codeless, so you just do data definitions. And if somebody changes your whole process and says, we've got new states, we've got new models, we've got a new map of where we can go from here to there, state models, very interesting way of doing that. All right, I've rambled on long enough today. I wish you all the best. Have a great Monday. If you've learned something, again, check that little like box to say this was helpful. And I will see you again tomorrow. If you've learned something, share it, and you will be a hero for everyone else. Until tomorrow, take care. Bye.